All right. I'd like to call a Coos Bay Public Schools Board of Directors meeting to order on April 12th, 2021, 5.30 p.m. And we need to start with roll call. So I'll go through the names if you can just say present are here. James Levine. Here. Dustin Clark. Here. Kevin Dubasar. Here. Adrian DeLeon. Here. Bryce Gretzky. Here. And David Gills. Not here. Okay. So we need to approve the agenda. Do I hear a motion? I'll move we approve the agenda. I'll second that. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, James. Any discussion? All right, then we'll go through. Kim is hi. James Labine. Oh, you're already in my right. Yay. Dustin Clark. Hi. Kevin Dubasar. Hi. Adrian. Hi. Bryce. Hi. All right. Motion passes. Um. All right. So we need to dismiss to executive session. The school board will now meet in executive session pursuant to ORS 192.660 subsection 2 to consider the dismissal or disciplining of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or agent unless he or she or the agent requests an open meeting. Represent representatives of the news media and designated staff and others allowed by the school board may attend the executive session. During this time, we will break into executive session. No decision may be made in executive session except in the matter of student expulsion. At the end of executive session, we will return to open session. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put it.
one second to make sure we get uh, streamed live again too. Okay. Looks like you Okay. Where did Kevin go? Um, he said he was here one second. He might need to come back in again. One second.
6 p.m. We're going to resume this Coos Bay School Board meeting and we have an action item to consider. I would make a motion that we uphold Superintendent Brian Trendle's recommendation for termination of employment. Thank you, James. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you, Adrian. Ms. Gunfin? All right, let's vote. James Levine. Aye. Dustin Clark. Aye. Kevin Dubasar. He is. He just entered right now. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to him. Adrian? And I don't know if he can vote without having um, a motion to do that. Aye. Um, Bryce Gretzky? Aye. And Kevin Dubazar, we're coming back to you. Can you hear me? No. I don't see him on my screen. He's oh, here, that's but it. muted. Kevin, you're on mute if you're voting. All right, my forward vote is I as well. Can we move forward? Or do this we need is to Kevin. Could you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I made the crossover. Uh, yes, it's an I with me. Sorry about okay. that. Technical problems. No worries. Thank you so much. Motion passes. All right. Moving along. We need a motion to approve our cons consent agenda. And in that agenda, we have our meeting minutes from March 8th and uh, March 12th, our special board meeting, uh, acceptance of retirement requests and resignation requests. This is Bryce. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Bryce. Second. Thank you, Dusty. All right, any discussion? All right, let's vote. James Labine. Aye. Justin. Aye. Kevin. Aye. Adrian. Aye. Bryce. Aye. And myself is an aye. Motion passes. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right. So we have building and staff presentations. Up first is Jacob Thomas. Hello, can you all hear me fine? Yes. Nice, okay. Um, I'm keeping it short today because we started in-person school at Marshfield for eighth and ninth graders today, and I was there at 7.30 in the morning to help. So running on very little energy. <laughs> um, but we're all, the people that are coming back seem to be pretty excited um, not completely thrilled, but they're excited to see their friends from what I heard talking to students today. Um, the eighth and ninth grade transition to in-person on a campus that is relatively new to them seems to be going fairly well. You know, I didn't, a lot of them were lost, but they found their way to class. So it's as much as you can ask for really. Um, and we, the seniors look forward to the um, senior drive-in movie on May 1st. It should be a lot of fun. It's the night that prom would have been. Um, and I guess I should give a shout out to ASB for being there today to help the eighth grade, eighth and ninth graders onto the campus. Um, in for their help tomorrow doing the same. And well, yeah, we look forward to some decisions kind of being made to 
getting closer to having a decision on graduation and knowing what that will look like. But that's all I have. Great. Any comments or questions for Jacob? Did you guys decide on a movie for the drive-in yet? No, I think that might be on me, but I totally forgot, so I'll have to set up a Google form. <laughs> and where is that going to be held? That'll be in the pirate parking lot. They're hiring professionals to run the movie part of it. Nice. Yes, it's exciting. And they're having it catered by Plate. It's a local food truck. Fun. That's great. Yeah. Oh, man, it's been a while since I've been to a drive-in. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Welcome back, everyone. Well, I guess it'll be welcome back, everyone, on Wednesday. So when the rest of the folks come to school, I'm, I'm assuming today was much like coming back after summer break, even more extended. So probably lots of kids getting used to getting back up early in the morning and getting their schedules on track. All right, highlighted school is Marshfield Junior High. Yeah, well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us here. I, I will say as a father whose daughter started today as an eighth grader, it was uh, it was a pretty special morning to finally get her out the door and, and going. So that was super exciting. And I can't wait until Wednesday when my uh, junior son also gets going. And I know he was up there with the ASB uh, with Jacob, probably helping out with uh, students and just Pretty exciting this week to be able to say that the, all the Coos Bay School District students um, are going to have the opportunity to be back in the buildings because we were there on February 1st. Uh, what Jacob says about some kids not being very happy about the way things were. Well, yeah, it's it, it's different. It's it's weird. And unlike our K-6 schools that started early, uh, we also came in halfway or beyond the school year. So uh, it was a different feel. So obviously, this was a uh, it's my first year as a building principal and quite the year to start off my uh, career uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic. But I've been very, very lucky and very fortunate to have an awesome staff, uh, certified, classified, everyone in the building. Uh, it's been great. And uh, I think we're setting the groundwork for a very special transition next year to the new building with our seventh and eighth grade. And uh, part of our process that we've been dealing with this year is, is getting our staff together and working with Mr. Trendle and Michelle, getting us ready to go and be staffed for, for next year as part of our process right now. I just want to give you a quick run through of the school year um, and then kind of where we are right now. And then I have Miss Cagley here, who's our school counselor, who did a program called Say Something. She's going to take a couple minutes and explain what we did here at the junior high. Um, so like like the rest of the district and the state and the nation, uh, the start of the school year was was a little rough. We had some bumps, as we didn't know. You know, usually when you start a new program, you have a year to pilot it. Well, our curriculum, we were piloting it on the run and on the go, and we were making adjustments as we went. Uh, we, we chose a fairly aggressive schedule, a CDL schedule for our teachers. And if you looked at them after the first couple of days, they were like walking zombies. And I was thinking to myself, what, what have I done to these poor people? Uh, the day was a grind, uh, but they were seeing a lot of kids. And of course, it's the frustrations of uh, lack of engagement. We, we made, I guess, a lot of adjustments and we, we did a little grade bump at the end of the, at the, end of the quarter. Um, myself, Ms. Cagley, Mr. Hampton, we did a lot of knocking on doors, trying to find some of those uh, families that were uh, having a hard time getting, getting locked in. We move on to the second quarter and, and we made some gains. Uh, some of those students were able to figure out the technology. Um, our teachers were able to get into a better flow of things with ingenuity, work out how the system was gonna work. And, and we made positive gains academically and with our attendance. Uh, although it doesn't look like a lot, we were able to jump up about 0.22 of a GPA. And the thing you got to remember is that we didn't give as much of a bump for the second quarter. So these gains that were being made were, were, were true gains that were uh, a lot of positive. 
On Friday, we finished our third quarter and our gains were even greater. We uh, jumped up another 0.5 of a GPA, a little bit more than a 0.5. Uh, now, again, if you look at it, it's not awesome, but it's pretty darn good from where we started. Um, our attendance is up above 80, about 85% of attendance with our online and our in-person. Um, a couple of our families are still having a hard time getting there, but we, we've made some good, good progress. Something that's been very good for our school has been the limited in process limited in person that we offer on Fridays uh, and also throughout the week. Uh, the students that come in to get away from the environment, uh, they've been able to work with some of our EAs or with some of our teachers and we have seen really good gains when we're able to do that. And even now that we have students back in the building, uh, we still offer those that extra Friday for kids to come in and, and to get some extra extra work. Uh, so again, if you ask my staff how they feel, how they felt issuing grades on Friday as opposed to back in November, it's it's night and day uh, the progress that we've made and, and those are those are awesome things. Uh, we've also tried to develop school culture and it's kind of hard to do when we're online. But one thing we've done is we are, we've done a good job with the relationships and we we do have a home room that we do offer with our online people. We did an online spirit week that was kind of fun and the kids that bought into it that had some dress up days. We had a dress up day competition on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we've done a uh, student of the month where has been really positive for me to be able to go knock on doors and give a family a, a yard sign that says Marshfield Junior High School student of the month that they're able to put in their in their yard. Uh, we can't bring people into the buildings and have the assemblies that we used to have. So so we're going to them. And that's been kind of a that's been a great thing that we've been doing here at the school. And then again, like I said at the beginning, uh, Ms. Cagley put on this program last month called the Say Something. And I'm not going to steal her thunder by any means. So I will turn it over to her to share uh, with you all a little bit about the Say Something program that we did here at Marshall Junior High. Hi, everybody. Um, so recently I presented, uh, it was a three week training to seventh graders at Marshall Junior High um, called the Say Something program. The program's aimed at reducing suicide and school violence and giving students the power to look out for their friends and fellow classmates. Um, students were taught how to recognize warning signs and the steps they should take if they see any warning signs. As you can see by the poster, the program teaches the students to look for warning signs, signals, and threats, act immediately and take it serious, and say something to a trusted adult. Um, I had the students do a brief pre- and post-training survey that allowed me to um, see how effective the training was while also gathering some other information. Um, we, will, we all know how important relationships are with students. And one of the questions asked um, on this survey was if they could identify a trusted adult in the school to go to um, for help if they needed. As you can see from the, um, can you switch it to the data, Shelby? Thank you. So um, as you can see from the data um, shown on the graphs, there was a significant improvement in the number of students that could identify a trusted adult. Um, the survey also allowed me to recognize which students um, still had not found a trusted adult and then to be able to um, put more focus on building relationships with those individual students. Um, I know no, nobody really wants to talk about suicide or school violence. Um, unfortunately, we also know that um, things can happen, things can and do happen. Um, the students see and hear things among themselves that we don't as adults see. So it was helping them realize that they have a lot of power there. Um, the program helped to empower them to know what to do if a need should arise and um, to help our school and our students safe, say, stay as safe as possible. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Cagley. And again, it's, it's not so much the, the violence and the suicide warnings, but for this year, it's just been traumatic for our kiddos, you know, and just the trauma and the mental health piece. Uh, and just knowing that they have someone that they come speak to that's a trusted adult in the school was uh, was huge for for any for anything at all. And again, I'm very lucky that I have a we share a wall, so I, I uh, see the, the communication or I can hear the communication that Ms. Cagley has with our students. Um, and it's a very nice bonus that we have here. So to wrap things up, today again was the start of the fourth quarter. Uh, we are 
prepared for this quarter, but we're also getting ready for what's going to come in the fall. Uh, our eighth graders and seventh graders will be forecasting soon for their elective classes. And I know that's kind of an exciting piece of the educational process. And we just have our fingers crossed that we will have as close to as normal return uh, in September as possible to give these kiddos a chance to do those electives that they weren't able to do this year. So with that, that is uh, Marshville Junior High School in a short little summary, maybe too long. But if you have any questions, fire away. Uh, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. I do have to say, I, I love the idea of the yard sign for the student of the month. That is very creative and innovative. Um, that would, I don't know, that, that would, my kid would love it. <laughs> and this Say Something program, I, I agree with you, it's a hard topic, but very needed. And so thank you for doing that hard work with our students. Are you talking to us or <laughs> I see your mouth moving? Mr. Go. It goes both ways. I said, I, I'm sorry, I had my, I had it muted. And uh, so I didn't quite hear what you said at the very beginning, if you had a question for us. Oh, no, I was just saying that I loved the um, idea of the yard sign for the student of the month. And my kids would just be tickled if there was a yard sign for them. So it's got to be great for the parents and for the student to um, have that. And it's, just creative. I love all the creativity. I mean, obviously, COVID's not fun. We've had a, a lot of adapting to do, but I do love how it, we have come together as a community to celebrate our children and come up with so, so many innovative ways to, you know, acknowledge them and the work they're doing. And then the stay, Say Something program is extremely important. So, and difficult, so thank you for that. Are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Montiel or Ms. Cagley? Okay, so moving along, we have OSEA business, Valerie. So Valerie, apologize for not being able to make it tonight, but she did say that she doesn't have anything to report right now, but she does plan on having something for the next board meeting. Thank you, Shelby. Okay, so CBEA business, Becky. And Becky also apologized for not being here, but she did submit a statement. I'd like to go ahead and read on behalf of CBEA. Uh, CBEA recently formed a negotiations team in preparation for contract bargaining. Our bargaining chair is Andrew, I'm gonna slaughter the name, I apologize, Andrew Ginniger from the high school and we have rep rep representation from each of our schools on the committee. Our first session with the district is scheduled for April 27th. Our Educator Empowerment Academy team is moving forward with plans to start an equity, diversity and inclusion committee with their first meeting scheduled for April 23rd at two o'clock. We had about a dozen staff members present sorry, a dozen staff members express interest in joining efforts on this committee and all are welcome. Eventually, we hope to have representation from educators, administrators, parents, and community members, and also students. The mission focus will be determined by members of the committee. Please reach out to Mary Margaret Stockert or Becky Crane with questions or interest. Becky Crane. Thank you, Shelby. That's fantastic. All right, I just wanted to confirm we do not have any public input. Correct, Shelby? Correct, no public in input submitted at this time. Okay. Um, district staff presentation, Superintendent Brian Trendle. Yeah, that's me. Uh, <laughs> looks like I got a long list of things here. So I will, uh, I got a lot, uh, quite a bit to talk about uh, today. Uh, starting with our 8-12 uh, transition back this week, 8th uh, and ninth grade today, uh, things went well. We did have some hiccups, uh, mostly in transportation. Uh, we had a bus that was about 40 minutes late. And, and uh, you know, we, 
we have that every year with every time we start school. Uh, it's one thing to put routes down on paper and think that it's all going to work. And then when you actually have to drive the bus and, and pick kids up and, and drop them off, it, it uh, it's a different ball game. So uh, Becky is, is working and her team are working very hard to uh, address that situation so that we can uh, move forward with our uh, – 10th, 11th, and, and 12th graders as well uh, on Wednesday when they all come back. And so, you know, when you when you bring kids back, where there's there's a little bit of anxiety, uh, particularly on my part, because I, I want this to be successful uh, because it's so important for our kids who need to be in person <clears throat> to have that opportunity. Uh, we've been we've been over a year away from Marshfield High School and having kids on campus. And, and that's just, that's just unthinkable. Uh, you know, nobody would have been able to, to tell me uh, a year and a half ago that, that we were going to have that. I would have, I would have never believed it, but it is exciting. Uh, even if it's not quite as exciting for the kids uh, to get up out of bed and get to get to school. Uh, it is really exciting for myself and, and, and staff and, and everybody who's involved. Uh, so we're looking forward to a positive transition back to this in-person hybrid model uh, for our 8th through 12th grade students. Um, talking a little bit about uh, things that are going well, you know, uh, Floyd mentioned the 7th grade and how things are going really well there for the 7th grade. I would just like to echo that K-6 is is going really well. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had cases that have impacted our schools and we've had to, to uh, quarantine and, and, and do what we've had to do to uh, keep, keep the spread from happening within our schools. And we've been able to do that and, and largely because of the measures we've taken as we have opened those schools up with our cohorts and our and our social distancing and, and safety protocols that we do. Uh, so things are going well there. For K-3, we've seen some really good growth in our reading uh, with our K-3 kids. You know, that's particularly uh, and, and most likely uh, attributed to the fact that, that our groups are small. Uh, and we all know that that small groups are, are priceless at this time when it comes to uh, <clears throat> instruction, particularly early on with our, with our little ones and in reading instruction. Uh, with that, I would like to transition to state testing. Uh, if you've been paying any attention to the, to the news or to, uh, to uh, news releases, press releases out of ODE, uh, initially, the state, our state, uh, put in a request to uh, not participate in state testing. Uh, they put that request into the federal government. Uh, the federal government denied that request, as they have all requests uh, from states to not do to uh, to do statewide testing. They did, however, allow uh, our state to go back and come up with a modified plan that is kind of a, uh, I would call it uh, micro state testing. How's that for a word? That's probably not a, not a good word or, or even a word, but uh, that was approved by the uh, federal government just this last week. Uh, districts really haven't seen yet the entire plan, but it involves scaled down uh, versions of the online uh, state test in reading, math, science, uh, and uh, those don't have to be done by, by everybody at every grade level. In the past, you know, for instance, our third graders had to test in, in reading and math, uh, and, and now third grade is, is only in reading language arts, and, and it's very scaled back. We only have to uh, we only have to spend one day doing state testing. There's no makeup testing. If you're there that day and you're involved in it, you will be state tested. 
uh, in, in your various grade level and your various subject matter. Uh, so a few of the secondary grades, uh, seventh grade, uh, eighth grade, and 11th grade are going to have to take two different tests, whether it's language arts and math or science and language arts. Uh, they're going to have to take two tests. Uh, but they're really, like I say, scaled down. Uh, and we will be providing those state tests. I know there's talk uh, around the state. Uh, one district, Ashland, uh, put out a, uh, they actually, their school board passed a, uh, what they call an opt-in clause in which if you wanted to be state tested, you had to opt in to do that. Uh, ODE came back fairly quickly and said that's a violation of Division II, uh, Division 22 standards and uh, won't be allowed. Uh, however, families can opt out, uh, which they've always been able to do. Uh, and, you know, we don't have to spend multiple days, uh, number one, testing kids, because in the past, when you test kids over a variety of subjects and in the expanded testing uh, model, it took several days to accomplish that. Uh, then you had makeup tests that you had to try to grab kids who were absent and, and try to get them in and get them tested. And it was really, it's really a time consuming and a disruptive process to the, to the general classroom. Uh, this go around, it's a one day shot. There's no makeup testing. Uh, if you're absent that day, you just simply don't take the state test. Uh, we will not be held accountable to the percentage of participants on the state test. We, we simply have to provide it, uh, and we will as a district. Chad's working hard on what that plan is going to look like. The testing window uh, from the state of Oregon opens up this week and goes through the end of the school year uh, or into early June. Uh, Chad's going to work on a schedule, come up with a plan, work with buildings to come up with, with the what the testing day is for that building, and, and we will move forward with state testing. Uh, any questions on those items before I move into what I'd like to call future future plans? Uh, you know, we we in the not so in the in the near future, we're hoping to make to have all of our kids in our district in some in at least a hybrid in person. And that's going to happen by Wednesday of this week. Uh, there's talk of, as our case numbers continue to come down in our county, which they have, uh, today's numbers were were much better than last week, and last week's numbers were much better than the, than the week before. Uh, we're seeing a, a nice trend when it comes to case numbers in our county. Uh, you know, the, the governor and... Oregon Health Authority also released the three-foot rule where they reduced the, uh, the social distancing for students. And I want to emphasize that for students within a classroom to three feet versus six feet. And it's while they're in the classroom receiving instruction. While they're moving about the building, still six feet. Uh, the adults in the classroom, the staff still have to maintain six feet. When students are eating, uh, they still have to maintain six feet. Uh, those are some of the things that we have to mitigate uh, before we can start the conversation of bringing our kids back to a full-time in-person schedule. Uh, I'm not saying we're going to give up on the idea before the end of the year. Uh, we did talk about it in our administrative meetings Friday uh, that I, I wanted are, are building principles to start looking at classroom space. You know, what is what does three feet mean for the amount of desks? Can we get the amount of kids in there that we need to? Uh, what does lunch look like? What does breakfast look like? Obviously, we can't eat in the classroom uh, completely. We'd have to spread out. Uh, there's some mitigating factors there. Right now, the, the requirements are in a, in a cafeteria or any large common space like a gym, we're limited to 40 at a time. Uh, so, 
you know, we can we can use those spaces, but we can't use them to their fullest. Uh, but we're going to take a look at it. We're going to take a look at, you know, what what that means. Can we do it? And then there's transportation. Uh, transportation right now is operating under the the guidelines of one student per seat, uh, with with two in a seat if they're siblings or from the same household. Uh, being able to bring everybody back to full time would mean that we would have to load those buses up pretty full. Uh, and, you know, that may be that that uh, the Oregon Health Authority uh, gives us a thumbs up on that, on that as well. Uh, the other part of that is having enough buses and having enough drivers. Uh, during this whole pandemic, uh, states around the nation have seen a major shortage in bus drivers. Uh, we were pretty fortunate because we we started kids back to in person uh, at the beginning of the year with our K-3 kids and then with our four through seven kids, adding them in uh, to in person. We were fortunate because we were able to borrow drivers. Uh, first student was able to borrow drivers from out of state and other places in our state just so we had enough to be able to uh, transport our kids in that fashion. Now we add in the high school routes and the high school kids and, and we're able to do it, but it's 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 getting trickier to do. Uh, so it's not just, and if you saw my, my email a while back when I said the three foot rule wasn't an automatic to uh, bringing kids back to full-time in person. That's truly what I meant by that was that it just because the, the rule of, of three feet versus six feet has changed for our kids within the classroom, there are other factors that that play into this. And we're going to work on those. We're going to work on trying to see if there's a possibility of maybe the last month or, or four weeks of school, we could bring back some of our kids, perhaps our, our elementary kids, to a full-time situation. Uh, not sure we can do it, but we're going to try. And in the process, we're going to set ourselves up for next fall. And, and next fall, we fully plan to be open. And we fully plan to be open full-time for our kids. Uh, and, and that's our goal. That's our, going to be our, our, our target. Uh, that's our plan going, going forward right now. We don't know what the future is going to bring us. Uh, we're going to bring you a calendar on, on the 26th of April uh, to adopt. That calendar uh, is going to be a calendar that is reflective of somewhat of a normal school year. It's going to be back to our five days a week with an early release on Friday. It's going to be back to uh, the assumption that we're going to be uh, back in school full time with our kids. Um, that's that's what we want to do moving forward. Uh, we've been kind of waiting for the calendar committee's kind of been waiting for for the governor and ODE and, and OHA to to lift some of the restrictions and say, you know what, next falls you're you're good to go. That's just not going to happen here in the in the near future. Probably not going to happen until uh, August when we hear from them about what their recommendations are. But we'd like to move forward. We'd like to be be able to plan to to open our schools and, and get our kids back to school. Uh, you know, when in August rolls around, who knows what we're gonna see from this from this pandemic, from this virus. We're we're headed in the right direction. Uh, that's what we know and that's what we're gonna plan moving forward. Uh, if we're able to get some kids back full time in our district. Uh, you know, that would be great towards the end of the school year. If not, at least we're going to be prepared moving forward uh, to do it at the beginning of the school year. So, you know, I've had some questions. I've had some questions from, uh, had a question from a, from a community member come my way. Uh, I've also had several questions about how can you bring the high school kids back while our county is still in a, extreme well our county's rapidly moving the the right direction so i feel good about that uh, but 
you know, I had a question from a community member about what are other school districts doing in our district? So I did a little research. You can go to ODE's website. There's a, there's a tab on the, uh, on the Ready School Safe Learners that's called a uh, school uh, system update, status update. You can click on that. The most recent data is from April 6th. They'll update that tomorrow. So I'll have some more updated information then. But as you go through it, there are, there are 1,607 school buildings uh, or schools in our, in our state, uh, not just districts, but schools. Out of those 1,607, uh, 364 right now are, are fully open to kids. Uh, and that's about 22% of all school buildings in the state. Uh, 737 school buildings are in hybrid model right now. Uh, that's about 46%. Uh, 420 uh, school buildings are in comprehensive distance learning. They don't have anybody back in person. Now, they have till the 19th to try to get that done according to the governor's executive order. So I, I anticipate we'll start to see some of these numbers change but that's about 26% of all the school buildings in the state. And then as of, as of April 6th, there was 88 school buildings that just weren't open. I don't know if that means they were on break, if they were closed for conference week. Uh, I don't know what that meant. But breaking that down, that 72% that of the school buildings in the state of Oregon are either in hybrid or CDL as of last week. Uh, and we'll take a look and see what the numbers do this week as we move closer to that deadline from the governor. Uh, I can tell you that Coos and Curry County, uh, there are two school districts that have kids back full-time in person, and that's Powers and Port Orford Langlois. And if you look at the schools uh, around the state who are open right now fully, uh, the majority of them are really small schools. Uh, there are some. There are also some private schools that are open, uh, and and those make up the bulk of the of the schools that are open right now, full time to to uh, students. Uh, so that's that's some data for you to kind of look at. You know, I, I'm. It's likely that we'll come back here after after we take a look at our buildings and we take a look at the cases in our in our county, and I, I, we may come back to the board and say, you know, are, are we willing to open things up, K three, K six, you know, what what are we willing to do here at the end of this year, uh, or moving forward when it comes time for next year, I would really like to have, uh, in in place a decision as a district uh, when we leave school at the end of the school year saying, this is what we're doing in the fall. Obviously, things could change. We know that. We, we've seen it. We've, we've lived it this entire year. So uh, that's where we're at uh, right now uh, with future plans. That's where we're at with a calendar update. I kind of jumped a little bit ahead. Uh, on my numbers there, giving you a little bit of calendar committee update. Calendar committee is going to meet again next week, and I fully anticipate that we'll finalize a, a calendar to bring to you on April 26th. Uh, questions? I've rambled. I've got a few more things on my list. I want to put it open to board members for questions. Um, I just had a question about what was the site? It was Oregon Department of Education, and then where do you look for the numbers? Uh, let me find it again really quick for you because I was just on it. It's called uh, School Operating Status. It's a tab under the Ready School Safe Learners. It's right in between the health metrics. It's right around where the, where the uh, health metrics tabs are, where you can also find today's... Uh, most current release of the case numbers for for all the counties as well. Perfect. Thank you. It, it gives you a nice graphic of of how many schools, actual school buildings 
and then you can scroll down and you can scroll down and read every single school in the state and what they're doing. Uh, like I say, the majority, 72% are in hybrid or CDL right now. Yeah, that looks right on par with what we're doing. And it's, you know, all along we have said in person is what we want to try to do. We know it's best for the majority of our kids. We do have a population that are thriving right now in, in, with online education. Uh, but, we, you know, the majority of our kids need to be in person. We know that. We've been trying to trying to do that to the best of our ability, but we're not going to be reckless about it. Uh, and, and that's the, if you know me and have listened to me enough, you know that's not going to not going to happen. Uh, but I also am a huge advocate of getting our kids back in the building and getting them back full time. Uh, other questions. Okay, I'll move on to the next couple. Uh, this next one's going to be an action item for you to consider. We do this every year. Uh, it's our inter-district transfer numbers. Uh, it, for lack of a better term, cap numbers. We don't really hold it as a as a hard cap, but it's a number that we try to try to maintain uh, as far as class sizes in our district. Uh, recognizing that at times we may go above. At times we may be below, but when it comes to interdistrict transfers, if we are above, we certainly look to uh, not necessarily approve those interdistrict transfers. Uh, and again, for K-1, that's 24 kids in a class. Second and third grades, 25. Fourth and fifth grades, 26. Sixth and seventh grade, 27. And then eighth through 12th grade core subject areas are 30. Uh, so those are exactly the same as they've been the last few years. Uh, I ask that uh, the board uh, take action on approving those interdistrict transfer numbers uh, as recommended. And I'm assuming that means you could do that right now, probably. So Kim, I'll turn that over to you. Perfect. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion to approve the interdistrict transfer numbers as uh, recommended by Brian. Thank you, Dusty. I'll second that. Thank you, Adrian. Any discussion? All right, time for the vote. James Labine. Aye. Dustin. Aye. Kevin. Aye. Adrian. Aye. Bryce. Aye. And I vote aye. Motion passes. Okay, next up on my list is Lighthouse Charter Negotiations update. Uh, we are really close, I think. Uh, and I say that optimistically. I think we're pretty close to uh, arriving at an agreement uh, on the charter language and, and the uh, charter agreement language. Uh, there's a few sticking points right now uh, in there, and, and most of it has to do with uh, who's responsible for what with the building and how much uh, is going to be uh, charged in rent uh, for the building and what that rent money goes towards uh, and whatnot. So uh, the district made a proposal to uh, the Lighthouse Committee uh, last week, uh, they will be coming back. We have another meeting uh, next week when uh, Candace returns from her vacation. Uh, we will have another meeting and we'll hear what, what their reply is to our uh, updated update to their language. Again, I think we're really, really close. I think we, both sides, you know, for the most part, want the same thing. We, we want we want Lighthouse as an option in our district. Uh, we think it's a it's a, a great program, a great option for some families. Uh, we don't mind hosting their charter in our district, but it really just comes down to the building use piece of it. And, and the fact that, you know, in the past, when they were at North Bend, they 
they rented what what essentially was a wing of a of a building that was already being used by the district to to run school. Uh, since they moved over here, they've been occupying a building that we haven't been using uh, and we didn't intend to use. Uh, and so, you know, for us to put substantial amounts of money into that building at the expense of our other buildings is, is a tough one for us to agree to. And so that, that could be a bit of a, a bargaining point that we're going to go back and forth on, I think, a little bit because they're asking that we we uh, take on quite a few expensive repairs to that building. Uh, and we're, we're just not in a position, I don't think, financially to be able to do that. Uh, and like I say, at the expense of our other building. So that's where we're at uh, with the lighthouse negotiations. Any questions? Okay, uh, the two ARs that are presented uh, for you, the admission of, of non-resident students, that language was, was essentially cleaned up to eliminate open enrollment, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there was language in there that, that talked about open enrollment. That is gone by the wayside. We don't do that anymore in the state of Oregon. Um, and there were, there were a few other language uh, issues in there that needed to be cleaned up to make it, to bring it up to date. Uh, the intra district transfer procedures, that's our out of zone uh, transfers. We, we, we made some changes in there, particularly around dates. Uh, it did have in there that families needed to notify us by April 15th, I think it was, if they were interested in an out of zone transfer we simply changed that because this last year we we made the change to allow them to do it right up till the end of, of the school year. And then we would meet uh, and, and make those decisions before the end of, of June and get back to them. Uh, it worked. It worked really well uh, this last year. And so we just made that adjustment uh, to reflect the, the practice that we want to continue. So those are the two ARs that I'm presenting. Questions on those? Okay. We're ready to move forward. Thank you, Brian. All right. So Business Services Finance Director Candace McGowan, I believe uh, she is on vacation. So lucky her. And we have the reports in our packet as Shelby is showing. And I would just comment that uh, before she left, Candace, uh, Candace and I went over these. Uh, there's nothing surprising in, in any of the documentation. Uh, she did send it out fairly early so you could ask her questions before she left. Uh, but if you do have any questions, uh, you can email them to me and, and, and I can either find the answer for you, answer it for you, or I will simply say we need to wait till Candace gets back from vacation. So uh, if you look at the enrollment, uh, we're still hovering just under 3,000. That's that's kind of where we've kind of landed for for uh, the last couple of months. Uh, you know, we're we're down 200 kids from what we expected. The bulk of those are are K six. Uh, our high school numbers look pretty good, really. When you look at them, uh, they're on par with a regular year. Our K-6 numbers are down a little bit. Uh, I did miss in my update that kindergarten registration is currently in process, in progress. Uh, that's one grade level that we're down quite a bit from what we usually are. Uh, we anticipate you know, we anticipate some of these numbers coming up next year, particularly if we're back full time. I would, I would think we'll see some of those numbers come back. Uh, but questions about any, any of that piece? Uh, again, feel free to email me. Uh, I'll do the best I can to answer the question or get the answer for you.
All right, moving along, board items, board member comments and highlights. Do we have any board members who would like to talk about highlights or have comments? Um, I'd like to say that uh, scholarship committee is underway and we are reviewing applicants and those will be turned in on the 25th and the committee will meet and that is steadily in progress. I'm excited for this year's scholarships. Thank you, James. Anyone else would like to add? I traveled to watch uh, Marshall play uh, in Cottage Grove. Uh, congratulations to all the coaches and players who uh, took the third place trophy uh, at state. Uh, also, kudos. I think Greg Mulkey was uh, instrumental in getting that playoff kind of rolling and going forward. So kudos to Greg. Um, uh, saw uh, um, a good pirate turnout, um, um, mostly being uh, mass respectful and all that kind of jazz and yada, yada, yada. So uh, it was a good day for the Pirates, uh, a good event, um, and uh, go Pirates. I would just like to say that my my daughter started up uh, classes again today, and it was actually her birthday as well. And we were one of the routes that had uh, the bus late for I think it was like 45 minutes late for her route. Um, so she she was disappointed waiting down there. But then we got her to school, and she was so excited to see her friends. And so um, I'm excited for Wednesday as well because I'll have another three off into school so um, looking forward to that anyone else all right so I get to do uh, fun appreciations so the first part is our licensed employee appreciation proclamation and I will read this out loud we've got a lot of whereas um, Whereas teachers mold future citizens through guidance and education, and whereas teachers encounter students of widely differing background, and whereas our country's future depends upon providing quality education to all students, and whereas teachers spend countless hours preparing lessons, evaluating progress, counseling and coaching students, and performing community service, and whereas our community recognizes and supports its teachers in educating the children of this community. Now, therefore, we hereby declare our appreciation to the licensed employees of the Coos Bay School District and proclaim May 3rd through the 7th, 2021, to be Licensed Employee Appreciation Week. And the Coos Bay School District Number 9 Board of Directors strongly encourages all members of our community to join in with it in personally expressing appreciation to our licensed staff for their dedication and devotion of their work. Adopted this day, 12th of April, 2021. So, hooray, let's celebrate our licensed staff. Thank you everyone. And then we, we're not done with celebrations. Um, Administrative Professional Sec Secretary Appreciation Day is April 21st. So remember that. Oh, I need to write that down. <laughs> um, National School Nurse Day, hooray, May, May 6th. And then School Lunch Hero Day is May 7th. And School Lunch Hero Day is that our beautiful cooks? Because they're our heroes, right? Good. Yeah. Of our food service workers with, um, yes, food service workers. Food is important. so. Thank you to all of our food service workers. Um, let's see, and then we've got one committee up and that is actually the committee I chair. It's our policy committee. Um, just to let you all know that we're up for first reading on the following policies, which are student withdrawal from school, the JECE, -E, uh, student conduct, JFC, and then directory information, JOA. Our next, meeting i think 
Is it the 15th or the 22nd? We extend it to the 22nd on okay. Thursday the 22nd. Thursday the 22nd at Coos Bay School District at 4 p.m. will be our next um, policy committee meeting. And I think that is it. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all for your time and we are formally adjourned for the evening.